Hello, everyone. Thank you for logging on to our final day of NSC's annual conference. This session is titled Telling Our Story. Our speaker today is Maria Pinkleton, Public Relations Director for the Georgia Council on Developmental Disabilities. Thank you again for tuning in. We're so excited to have you all here. And Maria, the floor is all yours. Thanks so much, Rafa. Uh, my name is Maria Pinkleton, like you said, uh, with the Georgia Council on Developmental Disabilities. Thank you all for joining this session. Um, we are going to talk a bit today about the storytelling project that began with the Georgia Council in 2018. Um, so Rafa, if you would like to begin the slideshow. Awesome. So um, I have uh, been working with the storytelling project at the Georgia Council since, since its inception. Um, and just to give you a overview of what you guys are gonna learn in this session today, you're gonna learn uh, where the idea to collect stories came from, how we found our storytelling team, what the story collecting process looked like, the various ways that the stories have been shared, and then lastly, what we learned along the way. Next slide. So why do we choose storytelling? Um, has been a question that a lot of people have asked. And for us, it is a, a, a three, a, a triad of a, a, a grouping of, of reasons why we thought we could really make connections and connect with people through storytelling. Um, we know that through storytelling, it builds a lot of empathy um, and humanizes the quote unquote other. Uh, a lot of, as we all know, um, there are often times where that is absent in dialogues uh, about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It's also a very strong advocacy tool. Um, Brene Brown says that stories are just data with a soul. And so people, the more stories people hear um, about people with intellectual and disabilities living their lives, uh, the more advocates we are able to build in our communities. And then lastly, making connections. Um, there are great connections that are made between the ones that are sharing the story. And you'll see in the rest of my presentation, the multitude of ways these stories have been presented and how they just immediately connect with our community. People see a lot of alignment between themselves and the storytellers on hopes for um, having their own family, their own homes, educational hopes, career hopes. And so um, we find that that is like one of the big things also is the ability to make connections. Next slide, please. So how it started. Um, many years ago, um, I started working, actually today is my fifth year anniversary at GCDD. Um, and this day, August 2017 was when I started at GCDD. And at that time, our story collection idea was the picture that you see on the left. This was a sheet of paper that we would hand out at our advocacy days, um, every session. Um, and we, uh, our leaders in our um, advocacy and public policy um, department, who were at that time Don Alford and Hannah Rosenfeld, really um, wanted to support the advocates that came out um, in being able to quickly share a little bit about themselves with their legislator and have a leave behind piece. And so we put together this sheet of paper that just says, I wanna talk to you about, and then ellipses. And then this is important to me because, and then ellipses. And they, at the bottom of that page that has like the gold dome of the Georgia Capitol on top, at the bottom, your name, your address, city, state, and zip, phone number, and email. They could either handwrite this or they got this document before they came to our advocacy days and they could edit it if they wanted to type, um, type out their answers um, and then bring it in with them so they could either leave it behind or even read from it um, so they could have some reminders as they were speaking to their legislator. Um, fast forward to now, August, 2021, and you see on the right side of your screen how it is going. Um, so in the upper right-hand corner, you will see the blue 
green and cream uh, Hidden Voices logo. Hidden Voices is the podcast. That is one uh, component of our storytelling project. You will see t the Telling Our Stories homepage webpage, um, which exists. Um, the Treasure Map Storytelling Roadshow image in the bottom left-hand corner um, is our Storytelling Roadshow that toured the state this summer and just ended last month um, here in the Atlanta area. Um, and to the right of that, you will see a screen grab from our documentary film, 6,000 Waiting, that I know some of you have seen. Um, and so I will discuss those uh, in addition to a couple of other elements that have been a part of the storytelling project as it has progressed. Next slide, please. So our storytelling team, um, as you all know, every project that we as DD councils work on, um, when we send out the notice of funds available, we, looking, we look forward to qualified and energized people um, responding to them. And uh, we received uh, five, four, four amazing proposals, um, but the proposal that really hit home with us and we thought made a lot of sense and was very well thought out was led by Larsh Atlanta. Um, Larsh Atlanta, at that time, they had one um, home uh, here in the Atlanta area uh, and their director there, Tim Moore, thought that they would be an amazing group to lead the charge. And he connected with some entities, RIC, the logo in the center, the black logo, is Resurgence Impact Consulting. And they were the logistical mind um, and the reporting mind and the budget mind behind the project. Um, and then the logo you see to the right um, is of our lead storyteller, Story Muse, who is also known as Shannon, Shannon Turner. Um, she has been involved in several stages of the project and she was our lead story collector, um, first host of our podcast and worked on our story uh, telling roadshow recently this summer. They came together um, and reached out to other writers in the Georgia area as well as photographers for the first iteration of the storytelling project. Next slide. So a little bit of an overview. In 2018 to 2019, um, we did the Telling Our Stories Writing and Photography Collection. Um, once that was done, they were put on our website in the Telling Our Stories uh, webpage. In 2019, we um, also put some of those stories in, um, in, in our publications pieces that went in newspapers around the state. In 2019 to 2021, we began our Hidden Voices podcast, and that second season um, begins in August. Uh, 2019 to 2020, 6,000 waiting documentary was completed. Uh, what well, was done and then we uh, had our uh, kickoff uh, this, at the beginning of this, uh, of 2020. Um, and then the Georgia legislative book um, is actually a book of all of the stories collected around the state that was given, that was bound and then given to every legislative rep sitting under our uh, Bow Dome, our capital. Um, and that book includes stories as we uh, reached out to one person, at least one person in every Senate district in the state of Georgia to share their story. So no matter what district a legislator is from, there is a story in there of one of their constituents. And lastly, the 2020, 2021 Treasure Maps uh, Storytelling Roadshow, which I shared before, ended uh, last month here in the Atlanta area. So we're going to cover details of all of those in this, um, in the rest of this presentation. Next slide. So telling our stories, which was the initial story collection project. This is a little bit of the details from that. Um, and as you see on the right, a few photographs of our legislators, um, or one picture of our legislator meeting with um, an employee at uh, Chick-fil-A who um, is, was a young high school student. Um, and then a few other photos of storytelling participants and images that were captured as they shared their stories. So we ended up getting 100 stories from 53 of Georgia's 56 Senate districts. The writers and photographers traveled the state spending time with each storyteller. Um, RIC, the consulting group was great in strategically planning their travel 
So they would collect uh, several stories from an area so there wasn't overlapping travel around the state to make the best use of their time. Um, the stories were compiled into a book and then delivered to legislators, as I stated before. 56 senators and 180 representatives, the governor and the lieutenant governor have received those books. Um, we did an art installation at one of the Capitol buildings here in Atlanta of some of the photos and quotes from the stories. And then the website, ooh, there's a space there, telling our stories includes all the stories and photos overlaid um, on a map of Georgia. So you can pick um, where the stories are uh, depending on the region of the state. Next slide, please. So with the first 100 stories, we had over 235 individuals, groups, and organizations that were contacted. That outreach, it was a lot of work. Um, it was us sharing contact information with organizations we know around the state that are in our more rural areas and may not be as well known as others so that the team from LARSH and RIC could connect and um, be introduced to people that they thought would make uh, great storytellers. 98 family members participated in the project. 79 participants were identified as being willing to speak to their elected officials um, and or the media to advocate. Six people participated in a storytelling for advocacy workshop and 89% of the participants um, who completed the follow-up satisfaction survey said they were very satisfied um, and 11% said they were somewhat satisfied with the project. 80% also said that through the participation in the project, they are better able to say what they want or say what services and support that they want and what's important to them. Um, and so as you know, that type of data is captured so that when we do our reporting um, in DD suites, we have those measures um, to uh, be able to show at the end of the project that it was truly impactful. Next slide, please. So, the one of the other projects of the storytelling project was our Hidden Voices podcast. Um, that first season had seven episodes, um, and it was an amazing. Uh, it was amazing to actually hear from our constituents and have them speak to all different issues. Um, there was a lot of conversations around areas that are directly impacted by waivers. Um, waiver, uh, access to waivers, employment, education, were really the driving stories as they would be in yours, I'm sure, um, across our state. And so uh, Irene Turner, who is our connection with the Research in, in Impact Consulting Group, um, spoke on uh, our local public broadcasting show, um, Closer Look. And she said that we are hoping that people in power are listening to the stories of the people who they make decisions about each and every day. And that was really what we wanted through the podcast, through all of the stories, is that the people that are actually uh, making the decisions on the budgets, um, making the decisions in their communities are hearing the voices. So season two of the Hidden Voices podcast um, will be released this month. And we part partner with our local citizen advocacy group um, and it looks uh, on that podcast and it looks at the experience of isolation through the pandemic, especially in nursing facilities and in other um, areas um, of, of living um, and in learning and working. And that project showcases eight new storytellers. So Meet Us Publications. Um, when I spoke about the NNR publication um, venture that we did, we were approached by NNR Publications out of Chico Publications in California. Um, and they wanted, uh, they were, they're very much um, experts in doing inserts in newspapers that are supportive of nonprofits um, and other 50C3 um, organizations that are, or not our governmental organizations that are looking to get the word out about the work that they do. We strategically designed where we placed these five unique inserts that you see the covers of on the screen um, because of their location in key legislative districts. Um, the paper that's in the upper right hand corner that meet us with the blonde haired woman and her son um, in the red shirt that was specifically directed at Athens, Georgia. Um, our governor, Brian Kemp is from the Athens area. 
And we knew that we wanted for the papers in that area to have that insert in there. The stories that are in the papers are directly, are stories of people in that region. So we really specified it. Um, and it went into Athens Banner Herald, Oconee Leader, the Bainbridge Post Searchlight, the Blue Ridge News Observer Forsyth News, Lawrenceville Daily Post and Rome News Tribune. So these are smaller towns. This is obviously not the Metro Atlanta area. They are much smaller towns um, where we have key legislative players um, and we wanted them to see these stories. Next slide. This is um, a snapshot of some of the pages inside of the Meet Us publications. Um, this one is more of a central Georgia piece. Um, the page on the left with the two women. Um, the shorter woman in that photo is Nandy. Um, Nandy is one of our council members. She lives in Macon, Georgia, um, that's central Georgia. And um, so we really look to have um, diverse voices, uh, diverse ages, um, so many stories that people would be able to see themselves in at least one of the stories that we told or see someone they knew. Uh, we also took advantage in this publication of the opportunity to share information about home and community-based waivers, as you see on the right-hand side. Um, next, or beneath that story, you see some details about an explanation on now comp waivers, ICWP waivers, source and CCSP waivers and how they work. Um, and then over on the right-hand side, you see some details about employment. So it was um, our opportunity to use this um, publication to not only share snapshots into people's lives, but give details of the work that we as a DD council do across the state. Next slide. This is another page um, and some more uh, stories that were told. Um, we have a great balance of uh, young and old in the storytelling collection. And uh, we thought that the um, of our ability to give people a greater insight into the, the hopes and dreams of these young people was amazing. Um, both of these young women are fierce advocates. Um, they are all about going to advocacy days and their families having their voices heard. Um, and so we were very happy to include them both in the publication. Next slide. So our legislative book, um, that I touched a bit upon was uh, quite an endeavor. Um, and it was mailed out at the beginning of this last legislative session. So um, we obviously had a hiatus from last legislative session um, due to COVID. And so this session, when we knew that our um, legislators would be back uh, at the dome, at their dome offices, we mailed out uh, 200, was that 238 plus packets um, went to the Capitol. Um, and this is actually a tweet from one of our representatives, Beth Moore. She is um, just outside, she's in the Metro Atlanta area is her, her district. Um, and she posted this lovely piece on Twitter, thanking us for this wonderful, heartbreaking collection of stories from some of our most vulnerable Georgians, respect, represented regionally by Senate District. I read the SD40, my district story, and promised to read more. So there were so many, as you know, as it says, real lives. Um, and so what we wanted for people to understand is in their role as legislator, they are responsible. Um, as has been told before, has been said before um, by one of our stories telling um, participants, it's how you move papers or vote on things or if you do your paperwork collect correctly, that means an, another amazing day for a lot of people. Um, and so to be able to have our representatives see this and say, wow, this is, this is what my job is really about. Um, these are Georgians and I need to be serving them. I need to be doing right by them. Next slide. 6,000 and waiting. Um, is our documentary film that um, many of you may or may not have seen. Um, we have had several screenings since our, um, the debut of the film in January. 
um, across the country. And it is a documentary film about three Georgians with developmental disabilities whose lives are significantly impacted by the staggering lack and complexity of state Medicaid waiver funding. So in 2019, um, the interviewing, shooting, writing, and editing of the film occurred. Uh, our filmmakers uh, began with all of the stories that we collected, all of those story subjects written on post-it notes. And they wrote each person's name on a post-it note. They had a massive wall of post-it notes and they were moving them around, trying to figure out what stories would work best together. Um, they wanted to be, be once again, very diverse in the stories that they told and the part of the state that they covered. Um, and so in the end, we have uh, three stories that were told. In 2020, they began building the film's infrastructure and preparing for the launch. And then in this year, 2021, we had the film premiere, screenings, and it's been currently touring film festivals or beginning to tour film festivals locally. Uh, the full scale website for the movie is 6000waiting.com. And this is a little bit of the additional work that you will find uh, some resources on the website press releases, facilitator and discussion guides, a press kit, a screening kit, an advocacy kit, and other supporting materials so that those that are interested will not only know about the film subjects, but they will also know about the issues that we cover, where Georgia stands on those issues and how they themselves can go from film viewers to advocates. Next slide. This is a snapshot from one of our screenings. Um, we had so many um, people that had no connection to disability hear about the film and want to see it. And these are a few of the screenings that took place uh, through this month, or actually last month. Um, and so there are um, a couple of councils on there, as you see. Um, our Jewish Abilities Alliance here in Georgia, FOCUS, which is an autism um, supporting group, uh, our Shanghai Unity Network, which is a self-advocate driven organization. Um, and we have several others that are not shown there, but in all, it was approximately uh, 2,500 viewers across 50, 50, 55 screenings that have taken place thus far. Uh, we had a comment uh, made by Lauren Gherkin, who spoke a couple of days ago, um, the public policy analyst from the Texas Council on Developmental Disabilities, saw the film and said that this is the kind of material that would be beneficial for every lawmaker in each state to see. And that is so true. We have had people actually from other countries say that this needs to be seen in our country. Um, and so when we screened the film initially, the premiere January 26th, we had people from as far away as Australia that were sitting in on the screening. So it was an amazing uh, amount of people that got to view that film. Next slide. So this, um, the picture that you see here is of our storytelling participant, Naomi Williams who initially she and her son Noah participated in the writing portion, photography portion, and then were selected to be a part of the film. And Story Muse, the redhead that you see with the glasses that is pictured to the left of Naomi, also known as Shannon Turner, um, got to uh, talk to each other virtually about what Naomi's, uh, how the process was for her, how participating in the project was for her. And so we're gonna watch uh, this clip now of their conversation. Rafa, you will need to share the 
the sound from your presentation also. Apologies, I'm gonna start it again. It is still muted. Rafa, when you click share screen on your end, there should be an option to share computer audio. Uh, it'll let me be see. A... I apologize. I've, uh, let me see. Thank you. Okay, I'm on. Huh, because it's not telling me. That's weird. Yeah, it's not telling me that option. So I'm so sorry about that, guys. Give me a second. Okay, I think I got it. I apologize. It was uh, yes. Laura, and uh, just tell us a little bit about that experience. What was it like to be involved in that first iteration of the storytelling project that involved short and long form interviews and photos? It was um, it was enlightening. It was intriguing. It was something I wanted our family to be a part of um, because of how it was going to be used in the sense of going to um, the booklet for legislators um, to actually put a face and um, kind of the behind the scenes life, put putting a face with a story, with a name, so that you can put it with a budget. And so it was. It was a way to um, to tell our story, and I, I took I pictures. But I thoroughly enjoyed you all, and Noah did too. And and just being able to to share um, share life beyond disability. Did you have any trepidation about what we might do with your story, or were you concerned about if we would how we would handle your story? Um, I honestly didn't um, at, at that point in time, <laughs> as it, it couldn't be any worse than what had transpired in the sense of um, how Noah and I got to where we got. And so for me, it was if I can tell his story, if I can tell my story, the more people that we are able to get our story to, the better community will be. So I, um, a after looking up GCDD and looking at what was a part of it, um, I, I felt it was a solid organization and they would do right by us and not um, take advantage of us. Mm, that's wonderful to hear. So then you were involved the next year in the film, uh, the documentary, 6,000 Waiting. Tell us a little bit about what that was like. <laughs> um, that was life-changing in, in, so in so many ways. Um, oh my gosh, I might cry. Um, <clears throat> I never imagined that we would be a part of a documentary um, and what people don't know is the time of when the documentary was being shot, it was a very hellacious time for me with Noah in school um, in the sense of there were just a lot of things going on. It was just, it was just very bad. Um, and so with the documentary, it, it was important, another way 
of being able to tell the story. Um, and, you know, we, our life, our life is because of other people's decisions. Noah and mine. It's not everybody in the, um, well, it is everybody in the documentary. It's based off of decisions that other people make about our lives. Um, and as an opportunity to meet amazing people, um, the producers, the writers, um, and just be with, with people who have been with people around the world with varying abilities and to just get a different picture. It, it broadened my horizon. It, it reignited dreams that I had for my family that I've been told will never happen because of the disabilities that Noah has and the limitations that he has. Um, and so just being connected with, with others who believe um, that, yeah, you have a disability, but that doesn't, that doesn't define who you are and what you can do. Um, and then from that, when actually watching the documentary, so not knowing Ben, and I still haven't met Ben yet, um, and, and hearing Nick's story, I still tear each time that I watch it um, because Noah could easily be a Ben and Nick prior to waiver supports. And I am, my job is for him to be a productive member of society. Um, and the way that happens is by all of us being community, right? And so it's not just when he graduates from school, it starts in elementary school. And so the documentary, um, at first it was just, a, okay, we're gonna tell our story and you know, it'll be a short film and I don't know where it's going. And now um, to see the impact that it has had on my colleagues, um, on, on our circle of friends, but more so in, in my reach has really been with the schools, educators, as well as the medical communities. Um, and being able to say like, people will see Ben jumping out of the, the, the plane and like, he's not really skydiving. Well, what do you think he's doing? Yeah, see, <laughs> he really is skydiving and his dad really does mow the lawn naked. <laughs> they, they have footage of that. <laughs> um, but it really, it, it, the documentary is really putting, um, it's humanizing, you know, individuals and families with disabilities. And it also sheds light to how we dehumanize people. Why is Nick still in a nursing home four years later? Right. And so I've said I'm, I'm too young to be his mom, but I will be his cousin and um, and working feverishly to help get him out. Because I wouldn't want somebody to do that for Noah if Noah was in that situation. So as you guys can tell, Naomi was is very passionate about um her son um very passionate about the other two participants in the film that um she did not know um before the filming and now they speak quite frequently via zoom um and she hopes to meet them and spend a lot more time with them uh post pandemic so um she is uh, a lovely woman. She is a fighting mama, definitely. Um, and she was um, just a natural in sharing her story 
um, and really got a lot out of being heard. Um, that is what so many people ask, how did you find people who wanted to share their story? And the truth is when you belong to a population that is so um, typically ignored, when someone says, no, I want to know what's going on with you. I want to know what is affecting you and your life. It is very rare. And so um, we were, we consider ourselves quite blessed to have had um, the individuals participate in the project and the documentary. Um, the documentary is currently, um, the last screening that we had um, was organized by a group called Sound Off Films that we contracted with to handle all of our screenings and logistics, registrations, um, Naomi, her son Noah, and then the other two participants in the film, Ben and Nick, um, frequently would be on panels that were a part of the screenings. And so um, Sound Off Films managed that for us. Our contract with them recently ended. Um, we are at the beginning of our right five-year plan will be kicking off again. And so we will definitely be doing more documentary and film support work. Um, currently, we are in the process of working with the filmmaker um, and with uh, the group from L'Arche on entering more film festivals. And many of the film festivals required that the film not be in wide release before it's shown in their film festival. So if any of you on the call today um, in this session are interested in having a screening, please send me an email. I will drop my email in the chat um, and I can schedule a screening for you and your organization. If you have um, just a small group that wants to see it or if your whole council wants to see it and your staff, that is totally fine. We just can't do a large release of it and just put it on YouTube and have it still be a um, qualify as a contender for film festivals. So that is our weight on having the film distributed widely. Next slide, please. So the most recent iteration of our storytelling project is the Treasure Maps project. And if I haven't said it before, our group from L'Arche handled the, the pandemic beautifully. Um, they knew they needed to get stories done and tell stories and share images and build community and, and build advocacy efforts across the state, but they had to do it during a pandemic. Um, and so they quickly created the Georgia Storytelling Roadshow that um, was done in the cities of Columbus, Savannah, Macon, Athens, Dahlonega, and then Atlanta. The Storytelling Roadshow was a traveling community event that happened in six cities. There were 10 storytellers that actually shared their stories on screen. Um, one storyteller for the bonus track, that was uh, the actual advertisement that was for the project. Um, and then the screenings across the state had 520 attendees with 75 local team members and volunteers. So for every city that you see listed on top of the screen, not only was a grand marshal needed, um, there were also volunteers that were handling seating and setup and traffic. Um, and so these events across the state so that they could be safe outdoor COVID friendly events were pop-up movie theater events. So um, they, you can actually rent a pop-up movie screen, inflatable one, I did not know you could do that. Um, and so they rented these massive screens and had all of these events outdoors. Um, and so the last one was a, uh, it did rain at that event, um, but we were back, um, the attendees there had all, we all had ample, ample time for vaccinations and those that couldn't receive vaccinations, we all agreed in, indoors, we all remain masked. So um, they chose a wonderful space, well-ventilated space where the pop-up screen would fit. And um, so the last event uh, was in Atlanta, like I said, at the end of June. So these festivals had some of the storytellers um, would be involved and come, as you see in the lower right-hand corner um, picture, there is a woman in a red top with a, uh, a sash across her. Um, and the sh show marshals, the storytellers, would wear those to identify themselves in the audience. And they would speak a little bit at the beginning of the screening. 
And then they would play the show with the stories from the different participants. Shannon Turner, um, also known as Story Muse, was wonderful also flexing in this COVID space. And she, once we announced uh, that this project was going to happen and we received so many applications, um, Shannon and the group from L'Arche went through and selected 10 um, and they are, they varied in level of how they, how good of storyteller they thought they may or may not have been. Shannon then held two, um, two Zoom workshops that went deep into what stories they thought they may want to tell, what makes the strong story, and then going through a process called story mapping. She had them share their, the, um, who they were in the story, the arc of the story, um, and then how the story plays out. So they're, they're, the stories that they wrote and that they filmed vary from an El Elvis impersonator and why he loves impersonating Elvis um, to a young woman who um, is a theater major, was a theater major in college and her time pre-college as a kid who was really into theater and uh, the challenges she received it, with her faith family at her church when it came to her being able to achieve her, her love of theater dreams. Um, and so they are wonderful stories and they have had such an amazing reception uh, across Georgia. So we were very happy with the work that we were able to do in the middle of a pandemic. Next slide, please. So the Red and Black is a newspaper in the Athens, Georgia area. Um, and this is a quote from an article that they did on the Treasure Maps event. A lot of times when you, know, when you come to things like this, you see a lot of the same people that you know, um, said Georgia Options Advocacy Director Pam Wally. This is new folks. This is different people. So I think this is a lot more inclusive of more than just moms, dads, and people with disabilities. It's more reflective of the Athens community and how disability is just one difference. So we were really excited. I believe the Athens event was probably one of our largest events. Theirs was almost like a festival. A lot of the cities just did it like really big and they would have food trucks out because it was outside um, and in big open spaces. And so they could really make a very um, festive event out of the screening of the film. Next slide. So we are now going to see two stories from the Treasure Maps Roadshow. On the screen now you see six photos um, of six of the participants. And um, the first, uh, we're going to watch um, two of the stories that have been told in the Roadshow. One is by Ronald Bavel and the other is by Angad Segal. Rafa, you can begin that showing. My name is Ronald Bovell. I am the age of 23 years old, and I am from Stockbridge, Georgia. I will be reading The First and Tragic Haircut by me, Ronald Bovell. It's actually based on a true story. Let me take you back when I was just a little kid maybe three to four years old. I live in the Bronx with my family. There were four other siblings, my grandparents, my aunts, cousins, and Auntie Lucy. Auntie Lucy took care of me and my brothers and sisters, but mostly me. She didn't really understand my autism and thought when I showed autistic behaviors, I was just being plain naughty. Sometimes, this is what it looked like for me to be a little tyke with autism. I constantly had food in my hair. My speech was hard to understand, and I wanted to eat the same things all the time. I really disliked being dirty, and I didn't like new people around. It was a very frustrating life for me and my Auntie Lucy back in the day. Did I mention I used to have dreadlocks when I was younger? 
I'll get to that part of the story a little later. Food had a strange feeling about it. It was all squishy and sticky. I always wanted to wipe it off my hands as quickly as possible, so I rubbed my hands on my dreadlocks. Auntie Lucy was not amused. She became enraged with me because she believed I was just being mischievous. Remember, back then, I couldn't talk much by using words and sentences. Trying to describe to her how much I didn't like the feeling of food on my hands was difficult. All I wanted to do was scrape it off my palms, and my hair seemed like an easy, safe place to put it. We went through this loop every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. One day, Auntie Lucy had just about enough of my behavior. She said we were going out. I didn't know where we were going, so I was kind of excited at first. I thought perhaps we were going for a stroll or the playground where I could go down the slide and on the swing. Maybe we were going to the ice cream truck that I liked so much. Nope. We ended up at the barber shop. When I realized where we are, I felt pretty nervous. It looked really scary. I questioned why we were there with my limited words. The clippers were also noisy. It got me so afraid that I felt like running away. I bet by now you've guessed what was about to happen. By the time it was over, I was forced to say goodbye to my dreadlocks. It's ironic that I mentioned that I had to say goodbye to them because remember, I actually couldn't really speak at that time. If I could have used words, I would have said something like, no thank you, I do not care to have my hair cut today. In exchange, I promise to try not to rub food on it anymore. But this is not fair. Sadly, nobody asked for my opinion that day. Sigh. My dreadlocks were all gone. I didn't know how to react. I didn't know or understand why she would do such a thing. One thing was quite sure. I was not happy. Not one little bit. On the way back, I felt like I was no longer myself. I kept feeling my head to see if I still had my dreads. Things got even worse when my mom and dad came home to see my dreadlocks were gone. My parents weren't very happy with Aunt Lucy. They were surprised, angry, and sad that Aunt Lucy didn't get permission to cut my hair. Not from them, and not from me. In the end, my dreadlocks were gone. I kept my same routine, but there was something different. To be honest, it was a little easier to wash the food off the hair on my head. Still, no matter what, Aunt Lucy should have received the message, we do not give haircuts to children without consent. And that is the story of my first and tragic haircut. I hope everyone reading and hearing this story will remember. Even when you are a little kid, you should get help to make choices about your body and your life. And that is the end of the story. Hello, how are you? Please come in. Hi, hello, how are you? I'm Dr. Segal. I'm 21 years old. I live in Sunny Springs with my family. And welcome to Pasada. I'm making chicken tikka and sick kebab. Uh, Pasada is a bus and a stand in India. 
if your place is named after a place in India, yeah. are you from India? Yes, I'm from India. My family from India. What part of India? New Delhi. Were you born there? Yes, 2000. And how long did you live there? <laughs> Two days. <laughs> okay. Am I so boring? No, I can't help Once it. I get really excited, okay? I was going to yawn. I said, calm down. <laughs> calm down. <laughs> calm yeah. down. Get me one of the skewers, please. All right, take it. Thank you, sir. And now let's cover it. No, we'll put, we'll put some of the seat the bottom. So if you only lived in India for five years, yes. do you have memories from there? Yes, I have. What's one of your favorite memories? Eating food in India. I understand that you learned to cook when you were in India. Yes. Who did you learn to cook from? My friend, Bajot. And what was his favorite thing to cook? Indian food, like butter chicken, kebab, dal, roti. That's some of the things we're going to eat today, right? Yes. We've traveled into your past a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now let's travel into your future. How are you feeling about going to college? Happy and excited. Where are you going to go? GSU. And they have a, a program there. Yes. It's called Ideal. Yes, Ideal program. And you are specifically hoping to go because you would like to... Open my restaurant. Which is why we're talking about cooking today. Yes. So when you open your restaurant, what kind of restaurant do you want it to be? Will it be Indian food? Yes, it'll be Indian food. Will you maybe call it the same as your cooking show? Basada. Basada? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Excellent. It's good? Yeah. Sorry, it took me a while to unmute and, un and open my video again. Um, so those were two of the stories that were collected um, and, and filmed um, during the Treasure Maps Roadshow. Um, and we were so um, honored to be able to share all of the stories uh, and thought that they were, again, another amazing snapshot of Georgians uh, that are living with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. Um, next slide, please. So some project-wide accomplishments from the Treasure Maps Roadshow. There um, was quite a bit of press done about it. Um, there were 13 articles, three radio interviews. Um, and so the, and then the first 100 written stories uh, from earlier on in the project became a media campaign encompassing newspaper, the newspaper inserts that we talked about. There was a radio campaign on Georgia public broadcasting and three television appearances. Overall, there were 475 Georgians with developmental disability that have participated in the project and eight DD councils thus far have inquired about beginning their own storytelling projects. So we have um, covered a lot of road um, from where we came from with that little fill out a sheet of paper, uh, leave behind. We have been very lucky to um, be able to have a council that supported this project within our budget. Um, very important to have people approving budgets um, for you to do this kind of work. But uh, as we have spoken to other DD councils, we have um, made it a point to share with them your ability to do some type of storytelling project or initiative within your DD council in your budget. There are many ways in which to start uh, this project process. Um, and I don't want anyone to think that they are not included. Um, it's not, not to include this as a possibility in how they build advocacy and uh, community awareness of, around the work that we all do. 
Will you go to the next slide? So some of what we've learned. Um, we have learned that people are, were being connected because of the work that we were doing in communities, uh, across cities, across the state. Um, we learned that Georgia still has a disappointing amount of people in our nursing homes. Um, if you all have seen the film 6,000 Waiting, one of the story subjects, Nick Papadopoulos, still lives in a nursing home here in Georgia. Um, and we are eager for him to have the connections made when it comes to HCBS funding so that he is able to leave the nursing home. Um, and also, finally, what we learned is that the project was garnering a lot of attention of our legislators. Um, if you look on the right hand side, there is um, a tweet posted by Senator Reverend Raphael Warnock that says home health care workers in Georgia make an average salary of less than $11 an hour, while nearly 7,000 Georgians are on the wait list to receive these vital services through Medicaid. The hashtag Better Care Better Jobs Act strengthens and expands these services because hashtag care can't wait. So we are very honored and proud and lucky to be in a space in which we are able to create content to drive the awareness of this need in Georgia. Um, now, as I said, the film is called 6,000 Waiting. Between the year when that film was done, 2019, and now we now have 7,000, I'm sorry, 1,000 plus names that have been added to that list. Hence his reference of 7,000 Georgians. So, um, here in Georgia, we have a lot of work to do, and I'm sure that you all have your own challenges in your states and your own wait list numbers. Um, so do you all have any, oh, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> um, this final shot is from our last uh, travel road show with several of the storytellers, um, and then um, Shannon Turner, our story muse, in the black and white dress and yellow necklace. And then on the end there is actually um, a very well-known Atlanta area celebrity. Um, his name is Jim Burris, and he is one of these news anchors from Georgia Public Broadcasting Radio. Um, and so he was our master of ceremonies um, at the Atlanta event. Um, I am open for any questions you guys have about this process. You can drop them in the chat or unmute and ask a question. And I will also place my email address in the chat so that if you have any questions that you think of later, um, that you would like to ask, feel free to send that information my way. Yes, I see Craig has his hand raised. Uh, thanks, Maria. That really great presentation. And I really love what you guys are doing there in Georgia with that storyteller project. Um, the question I have for you is, do you have any recommendations for states that might be like a lower allotment state? Uh, that may have more limited budgets uh, than what Georgia has and how we could leverage the, you know, storytelling and finding good storytellers uh, in our areas. So that's a great question. I get asked that question a lot. Um, I have learned that the art of storytelling and the art, the craft of teaching others how to tell their stories is quite popular. Um, so for those who don't live in our in the Atlanta area, um, there are storytellers around the world and many of them are teachers of storytelling. So um, for instance, the workshop that Shannon did with the, the 10 featured storytellers, that was something that she does quite frequently. Um, and I know that many of them vary in cost. They have lower cost, um, uh, lower price points for nonprofits or schools. So I would urge you to just do a Google search for storytellers in your state um, and make it an event where you um, are able to do it via Zoom if you want to do it, right, with, with COVID. Um, 
do it online, um, Shannon was really able to do an amazing job uh, just being there on the two workshops she did with the participants and then just in phone calls that she had with them if they had questions, if they had concerns about the process. Um, and I, I was really impressed that she was able to really have them build their confidence and capacity in storytelling storytelling over Zoom. It wasn't even an in, uh, in-person session. You know, we have, I think we for quite a while were missing the richness of being together, but she really is able to make, and storytellers are able to do this, story collectors you will find, um, are really able to traverse that digital divide and make those spaces welcoming and really get people out of their shells um, and sharing their stories. So I would, I would say definitely look for storytellers in your area um, and I can um, give you all information uh, for Story Muse. I'm sure she has tons of contacts around the country um, for people that she would recommend. Uh, she had done a project similar to this with a, uh, another organization in town that helps with children experiencing homelessness. And so uh, it was the same type of workshopping and really getting them out of their shells and being confident in sharing their stories. Let me see, I think there was another question in the chat that says, it's by Jamie. I was trying to find the video for the first and tragic haircut story. Do you have a link you can post? So yes, let me, um, let me go to chat. So the videos have not been um, sliced together or sliced uh, individually yet. We've not completed breaking all the individual stories down. So the link that I'm putting in the chat is to the uh, Storytelling Roadshow link on our YouTube channel. Uh, that film, we are not putting in film festivals. It is free for everyone to look at um, on our uh, GCDD uh, YouTube channel. If you follow the link um, that I just dropped in the chat, um, there are the other stories in there. And so if you just slide through, um, just so you know, um, Ronald's story starts at minute 539. Um, so I have that here in my notes. So uh, yeah, if you want to specifically watch Ronald's and Ronald is not only an amazing storyteller and a great guy, but he illustrated his entire story. Um, and then also he illustrated, and I don't have it with me, um, hand fans um, they gave as a giveaway at the event because they were all outside and is roasting hot in Atlanta or in Georgia in the summertime. So he illustrated um, all the different uh, amazing things that waiver services do. And that design was made into like the church fans that they had at the events. So he is, he's a great, great young man. Um, I think there was one other story. Has anyone incorporated spoken word workshops to create stories in a creative way? That was from Valerie Breen. Um, are you asking Valerie like for the group? Is that a general group question? Let me unmute myself. That was a general group question. I wondered if you all had done that at all in Georgia and then if anybody had. So we, this was our first time in engaging um, storytelling workshop into this process. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But we have not done um, any spoken word work as a part of this process yet, no. The only reason I asked the question is a few years ago, this wasn't part of the DD Council, but we engaged in a project with one of the universities uh, who had an entire spoken word workshop and brought it to our camps. And actually it was absolutely amazing in the way that they taught individuals with intellectual challenges, how to tell stories through the spoken word. We actually had a, um, we had a, a disco club that night where people had stand-up comedy and they could tell their story. It was a different way to tell story, but it really, it really built on a good framework um, for people in a very creative way. So I just wondered if that had ever been thought about with any of, with you all or the colleagues out there. Colleagues. 
I will let others answer that. Something to consider down the road. I don't think there are any other questions that are in the chat. Um, I will say that we've had um, many of the people who have been involved in the project um, see, well, they're very excited when our magazine that we do, we do a digital magazine quarterly, and we always feature one story from the project in there. Um, when they uh, see it in that, it's like official for them. But many of them just go to the storytelling project website and print off the page with their photos and story on it and take that to their legislators or send that to their legislators. So we've been very excited with um, the ability for the thing that they gave to us as a gift, right? Their story to then become a gift back to them so they can use it as, as a leave behind or just like a bragging piece that they were in a magazine. There is a question in the chat from Emily Hartley. Uh, the project looks amazing. Did you get any data suggesting individual self-advocacy strengthened directly with their legislators as a result of the project? So we, um, the data that we collected in the project, it was multiple areas of data collected. Um, and so, yes, we, had not only asked initial um, the initial question of are people willing to uh, speak to media and press and then also to legislators, um, but then also do they feel that they have been, uh, their capacity has been increased in this area uh, and that uh, they took that then and built that relationship with their legislators directly. So our initial year data was good, um, but as we have progressed and those people that have taken part in the project have taken part in other events, specifically our advocacy days, uh, we have not received data. And now that we're at the end of the project, all of the, from the roadshow to the podcast, to the book, um, we will be doing more data gathering from participants because we see them showing up more at advocacy days. We see them learning more about building personal relationships with their legislators and really becoming the experts on disability um, and having their legislators call them um, with questions uh, and comments. And so that is definitely something that we know um, anecdotally that is happening. But yeah, we definitely want to, now that this project has ended, the uh, data that the LARSH team is getting together does include that type of data, those types of figures. Um, Craig, I see your hand up again, I think. Yeah, well, this is kind of a follow-up to Emily's question. And I, you know, this is maybe uh, DD Council wonk stuff in regards to reporting. Uh, it, it sounds like you're collecting pretty good data on the um, IFA measures, which is the individual and family advocacy. Uh, do, do you have any data on the systems change measures that um, resulted uh, from, from this project? So we have the data that um, we are doing that is more, or sorry, that we are gathering that is, um, how do I put this? So really look, we were really hoping that public awareness, to build public awareness on this. Um, and so in looking at our um, points that people come to be with us. So for instance, um, the number of people that come and join our advocacy network, as we call it, which is our database, um, has increased tremendously um, and those drivers, a lot of those drivers uh, being either the movie or the roadshow, or they saw the article in the magazine. And so that's another end of the project bit of data that is being gathered. Um, but we have seen significant, because of laying those little pings, you guys know you have to, um, you may or may not know that you have to kind of lay 
uh, points along the road to see exactly how people made their way to you. Um, specifically when they have no family members or they themselves don't have an intellectual development, developmental disability or they don't work in the field. So we've definitely seen an increase um, through those channels and we wanted to break them down. Thus far, the largest uh, pathway to our network has been the film, 6,000 Waiting. That has been the biggest driver of people that had no previous connection to the work that we do, um, no previous connection to the IDD community that are coming in and joining, uh, joining us and learning more about our work. Um, when you come in and join our advocacy network, you get our policy updates, you get our magazine, you get our newsletter. Um, and so it has definitely been um, something that has been impactful on a public awareness side. Um, but then we consistently, um, when we have people go and see their legislators or call our legislators, they will say, I've heard about GCDD's project on this. I saw the installation at the Capitol building. I saw the documentary. So there are, um, it's definitely bringing in the people. Are there any other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, I have placed my email in the chat. Um, and just to reiterate, um, if you visit our website, gcdd.org, you will find um, links to the podcast. If you guys were listening to the first, like to listen to the first season of that, and then we invite you to join us uh, this month for the release of our second season of that, as I said before, that focuses on the pandemic and isolation. Um, also, all of the stories from the around the state from around the state are on that website. Links to the six thousand waiting film uh, are on that that film website are there. And um, I also put the link in the chat for you guys to directly access the Treasure Maps Roadshow. Um, while we had uh, we offered panel support and uh, discussion support for six thousand waiting, we don't have the same structure. Um, in place for the roadshow, but please reach out to us because um, the people that took part in that love to have conversations about what the process was like for them. And uh, Story Muse, Shannon Turner, loves to have conversations. And so if you guys are interested in having any of the people that are in the film um, or Shannon herself, feel free to reach out to me at my email address and I can put you in contact with them. If that is all, then I'm going to say thank you, Maria, for such an awesome presentation. Thank you for listening. Um, as you know, today's the last day. So at four o'clock, we have our closing plenary session. Um, so be sure to tune on for that in the main conference site. But if, if we are done here, I want to thank again everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Maria, for a great presentation. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, all.